where do you think you are now? Mm -hmm. You're probably way behind the curve. You're probably like, we, you know, getting breached and stuff like that. You can't take a vacation from investing. Hey, I'm not saying I so, agree. I'm just trying to play AI advocate here. I'm trying AI. to think really hard because budgets are tough. And if you have magic IAM people, IAM heroes, as we like to say, running around behind the scenes, just making it work, and the organization doesn't feel the pain of not having, you know, modern tools, let's say, could you have gotten away with it? I would argue yes. It happens. It still happens today, right? But sure. should you? You can get no. away, <laughs> Jeff. You can get away without buying life insurance. Mm -hmm. But if you die, then your family will have no money. Well, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> this is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself. I'm doing great, man. I'm in a good mood. How are you feeling? <laughs> oh, all right. You caught me. I'm a little crabby I don't, and I don't know why. I just have one of those days, I think. You know... Whenever I'm feeling crabby, I think about crabby patties and how they're like the jam. I never actually had a crabby crabby patty, but that was like the hamburger looking thing that they had on SpongeBob. Are you talking about a crab cake? I don't know, like the hamburgers on SpongeBob that they made at Mr. Krabs restaurant. Jim, have you I'm, ever watched SpongeBob? Jim, I'm a grown ass man. I have never seen SpongeBob. <laughs> oh, you're you're missing out, bro. You're okay. missing out. It's not, it's not, it's, it's like the Simpsons. It's a cartoon, but I mean, I've so seen many, like, pictures of it. That, I've seen like, you yeah. know, memes and stuff like that. Right, that's funny, whatever. But no, I've never, I've never sat down and I don't think I've ever seen more than three seconds of a SpongeBob thing. Oh yeah. Missing out, man. Missing so you're, is this out. something you're doing? Uh, just watching SpongeBob, SpongeBob all the time? Well, no, I, d I guess I did have kids that we're in the right age range for that show for a See, while. So go. I'd wind there up watching go. it. But there then I realized that, oh, this is one of those cartoons that's meant to keep adults entertained as well, like <laughs> Simpsons. See, there you go. I don't have kids. So I never, I never, I have not gone through any of those phases. <laughs> just keep, just watch an episode or two. Like, what do you have to lose? I don't know. <laughs> You're not in Time. the right mood for that kind of suggestion <laughs> yeah, today. Yeah. Don't try and don't try and solve the problem, Jim. I just want to be crabby. <laughs> <laughs> crabby patties. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that I'm not crabby about, and this is kind of a milestone for us uh, this morning, was we crossed over 300,000 downloads of this tiny little I am podcast. Not so tiny anymore, I guess. I know. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record and say, I remember when we had 20 downloads of the first episode and we knew all 20 people were mm -hmm. but we literally just started by you saying one day let's start a podcast i was like okay thinking this won't last mm -hmm. we're coming up on 300 episodes and 300,000 downloads pretty amazing well it's pretty amazing is it took yeah we had no idea what we we're doing 100,000 in the it took four and a half years roughly to get to 100,000 because remember we celebrated that at identiverse last year and we're at 300,000 and it's less than a year later, which yeah. is absolutely bananas. I mean, we saw a ton of growth just within the last, you know, several months and stuff like that. But it's a lot of fun. We still do it. Uh, you know, this is not our job. We do it because we like doing it. And, you know, thank you, everyone who's listened, subscribed, shared, you know, all that fun stuff. And yeah, it's kind of fun. Take a step back and, you know, that'll probably, that'll probably put a smile on my face now here for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, just thinking about it, like that doesn't include our YouTube stats. So if you count those in, we have like 301,000 downloads. <laughs> Three, no, 300,001, you mean. <laughs> yeah, pretty our much. YouTube channel is but, still very small, but we are putting more uh, emphasis on it, starting to uh, think about how we're going to do video episodes. Um, Still a little bit of a challenge from a timing perspective. Just, you know, fourth, fourth, fourth wall here is we're recording this on a Friday <laughs> and this needs to go out Monday. I have other stuff to do and I still need to get this edited once we're done and trying to figure out how that quick turnaround will work. So this might end up being only an audio episode, but 
if it if I have time, I can figure out a good workflow and get better at it. There may be video episodes showing up on YouTube. So go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, like, do all that stuff the same way we built up the audio podcasts. We're going to keep doing that, but we're going to start doing video as well um, as time permits. And hopefully time will be more permitting in the future. <laughs> yeah, because the real thing is like, I think when people find out about the podcast, probably half of those people will continue to listen or in the future watch the podcast. So when people go out and like and subscribe, it helps more people find the podcast. And, you know, hopefully, I mean, the way I look at it is it's a community. ID Pro yeah. is a community. I think the listening of Identity Center is a community. I see a lot of people, you know, really get a lot of uh, value out of it. And we get to meet folks and introduce those folks to other folks. And uh, it's it's everything I hoped it could be. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. We're having fun doing it, and we try to keep it fresh. So we'll keep doing it until one or both of us gets bored. <laughs> and then that'll be it. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's a Friday night. Uh, what do we want to talk about this week? I think, well, first we have to talk about, like, all the conferences that are coming out. Mm -hmm. The first one is Identiverse. As everyone knows, it's like the one of the biggest conferences within the I digital identity industry. It's May 28th through 31st at the ARIA. We've got a 25% off discount code. It's IDV24-IDAC25. It's kind of a long code, but hey, when you get 25% off, I think it's worth using. And you pretty much go to identiverse.com and you can figure out how to go through the registration process. Um, I know early bird pricing is up soon. It might already be up, but the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. So I'd say get out there and register <laughs> as soon as possible. Jeff and I are going to be there. We'd love to meet every one of our listeners or as many people as want to come up and introduce themselves. We'll be, um, at multiple places so we're having a um a happy hour i think it's tuesday night but uh reach out to jeff or i on linkedin shoot us a dm if you're interested in meeting us and going to the happy hour it's going to be with talus um it's going to be at the one of the bars in the aria <laughs> i think do you remember what it's called i don't remember but it's with talus and rsm right and i think that's the plan yeah talus and rsm um we're also going to be recording live episodes. So there's one room that's kind of like a, a fishbowl recording studio. And folks can stand outside of that, look in, and they have headphones available that people can put the headphones on <laughs> and listen to what's going on. I, I know you're laughing, Jeff, but that's a huge improvement versus what we did last year where nobody could hear us. Yeah. So I mean, there's two options, you know. right? You can either, and I think that's going to be in between both of the expo halls. There's two expo halls this year. It'll be a fishbowl. We're kind of sharing it with the CRA uh, TV folks, the folks who help put on um, Identiverse Cyber Risk Alliance, who've been great partners throughout this. So we'll kind of be using unused time from them. And we'll also have a conference room somewhere. I don't know exactly where it is yet, but there will be a sign outside of it where people should definitely be able to hear us then because it'll be a little bit further away from everyone. We'll be kind of in a room. We'll have different guests. I hope we'll have some chairs. Maybe, maybe one or two people will show up and watch us kind of record one of these things live and and uh yeah that'll be a lot of fun yeah so and the third thing well we had a, a third thing going on as well for people who, oh we we're going to be with rsm and talus at the talus um uh like booth or whatever right booth <laughs> yeah what's that the yeah, booth, the booth or whatever it is the on the expo floor yeah. expo hall mm -hmm. so there's going to be an opportunity to drop by and meet us there as well Again, if like you're interested in any of those things, just reach out to us with DMs or play it by ear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just we'll drop do it by live. any of the things. <laughs> yeah. Just like we do here on the podcast. Just we'll do it live. <laughs> just, yeah, just wing it. Yeah. I'm also hosting a, or moderating a panel, I guess, probably a good way. So uh, former uh, guests on the show, Sean O'Dell and Atul, uh, Atul Shibagwe, um are going to be talking about CAPE, C-A-E-P, Continuous Access Evaluation Profile. And they've asked me to moderate a panel that they'll be on. So 
I will be the everyday man trying to figure out what the heck they're talking about as I moderate this session. So that'll be on Wednesday, May 29th at 1140 AM. So I hope people come out and check that out too. I've not done a lot of moderating for conferences. I think it's maybe my second or maybe third time. So um, watch me be nervous up on a stage with a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, that was such a good episode that we did. I mean, those guys are really on some of the cutting edge stuff. So I think a lot of us in our day to day, we we're doing things that have been kind of established. I always think of identity as like, for the most part, you're kind of like doing things that have been proven to work. People call it best practices. I don't like that term, but they're, they're proven technologies. These guys are kind of like moving into areas that are, I wouldn't call it bleeding edge, but they're newer. Like Cape is newer. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can learn a lot because I think, you know, if it picks up steam and gets more folks adopting, it's going to be proven technology. And, you know, Sean would probably already argue it is proven technology, right? But he's out there proving it. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So then let's see, after Adeniverse, we've got people probably hopping on a plane going straight to European Identity and Cloud Conference. That is June 4th through the 7th in Berlin. Uh, we have a discount code for that as well. EIC 24 IDAC 25 gets you 25% off. We'll have a link in our show notes for that one. We will not be there, but fortunately we have a, a code that we can share with folks. What we will be at later this year is identity week. And there's a handful of conferences throughout the year. So there's Europe, which is in Amsterdam, June 11th and 12th. Uh, there is uh, Americas, which is Washington, DC, September 11th and 12th. That's the one Jim, you and I will be at. And then mm -hmm. Asia, October 22nd, 23rd. IDAC 30 gets you 30% off of all of those uh, conferences. So looking forward to that. So kind of cool. One of the things we should do is kind of try to highlight the different conferences that are happening throughout the year. I think we'll have Authenticate coming up at some point later this year. I mean, I know it'll be happening, but we'll have, I, I hope, a discount code for that one so that people can register yeah, for that. And yeah. Andrew Shikiar will come back on the show and help us understand like what's going on there. We'll play a part in that with the podcast. I also wanted to mention RSA is coming up. We don't have a discount code for that, but it, how many times have you been asked so far, Jeff, if you're going to be at RSA? I think everybody has asked and I, I have been in the past. I think this is the second year in a row that I haven't gone, but I think there's probably a streak of like three or four that I went to, but just not this year. So here's what my approach of it. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking to look, asking you to try to put it down or anything or pump it up. But what is your, what's your thought on RSA? I think it's great for meeting folks. I'll be honest. I don't think I've ever actually attended a session <laughs> the way that I go. And this is a pro tip for folks is if you want to go to RSA and it's expensive for sure, get just the business hall pass and go walk to the expo hall. You can literally spend two days just exploring it, seeing what new technologies are out there and stuff like that. That's usually what I go for is that kind of thing. Um, every once in a while, you might be able to sneak into a side room or something like that to catch a session. <laughs> but I, I don't remember. I don't know what it cost this year, but it was like 50 bucks a couple of years ago. You know, maybe it's gone up in price, probably like everything else. But that was always my pro tip for RSA was just even, you know, if, if you're looking to save some costs, the money you save on travel or the money that you save on the, on the conference pass can be for the travel. That's a little more expensive for San Francisco. Yeah. My problem with San Francisco is like. $400 hotel rooms <laughs> per night. I mean, yep. if they would move it to Vegas. You could get a lot cheaper. I mean, $200 a night, you can get a nice hotel room. Oh, yeah. And it's Vegas. It's built for that. But some people don't like Vegas either. So can't win. Yeah. Can't win. You can't make <laughs> everyone happy. Yeah. Well, let's see. How can, how can we make some people happy this week, Jim? Mailbag? We can, we can respond to their questions. Okay. And you have um, this crazy idea of how we're going to respond to these questions from listeners out in the world. Um, explain your idea here so that we can kind of set the stage because this is definitely going to have visual as well as audio components to it. And we're trying to make sure this comes off well for audio too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, considering the audio podcast aspect of it, um, we're going to read off the questions that we've gotten. Uh, these are real questions and we'll put them into an AI engine. So we're going to use Gem Google's Gemini. Not just Gemini, Jeff Gemini going... Advanced. Because I oh, actually pay for We're going to use the advanced version. <laughs> so I have no idea what's going to happen. But we'll it's enter them advanced. in. Jeff is very good at like 
command line prompting or prompt engineering, they call it. Right? There you go. Um, so he'll get us to as tight of a answer as possible, or if, say it spits out an answer and it's like two pages long. We're not going to bore you by reading that. We're going to get down to kind of like, you know, top five or, you know, mm-hmm. short descriptions. Then we're going to read them off. Obviously, if, if we get this out to YouTube and you can see the questions, you can see everything the AI outputs. But I mean, I think the takeaway from doing this is like folks can start to get the idea of like, all right, this is what you might be able to get from AI if they're not using it already like we are. And, you know, put in like top five of this or top 10 of that, see what comes back. And then my thing with AI is like, I, I kind of felt like when I first started using it, like the answers were so super generic that anybody who had been in the industry for five or more years would have, would know more nuance than what it was spitting out. Mm-hmm. So I'll be real interested. Like literally we're entering these for the first time as we go. So we'll be evaluating how good the answers are and whether or not we agree with them. Yeah. And hopefully helping out some listeners who actually sent some questions in. So your mileage is going to vary based on whichever AI model you're using. I just happened to pick Gemini Advanced as the one we're using today. But if you're using Claude or if you're using OpenAI, aka Chat, ChatGPT or Microsoft's version of, of ChatGPT, the reason I like Gemini is it's tied to Google, which means theoretically it should pull back more current information than some of the other models that are not trained on anything that's like within the last year or so. The only exception to that, I think, is Meta put out uh, their AI model this week, Meta.ai. You can go to the website, and that's supposed to be connected to both Google and Bing, but I have not really tried it out yet to see how good it is. So we're going to just go with Gemini. Just know that mileage may vary. So let's see here. I'm going to put this up on a question for you, just to start. What is the top identity or digital identity podcast? Are you going to make me type this out? Uh, what is sure, the top stuff. identity and access management podcast in the world? Yeah. This could be very embarrassing when it comes back with no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is no top. All right. So it's not All even right. giving like answers. So it's you know basically saying, okay, well, where subjectivity, evolving landscape, consider your interests, uh, and then where to find podcasts like, oh, we're on here. Uh, where to find podcasts. No. So podcast directories like Apple, Spotify, blogs, some popular I am podcasts to get you started in no particular order. Just something called identity and access management. I don't know what that is. Uh, let's talk about digital identity. That's by the folks over at UbiSecure. I know I've heard about that one. Uh, Manage Engine's identity and access management podcast series. I am Pulse by BioKey International. I'm not sure if I know what that is. Uh, the identity brief. And there we are, identity at the center. So, hey, I mean, no I guess. Order, no particular order, but we're last. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, well, that was a good warm-up. Uh, let's take the first question. This one's from Jay in the USA. And let me go ahead and paste this in here. Jim, you want to read the question while I'm getting this set up? Sure. So the question is, what are the top IM metrics an organization should collect, track, or monitor for? Okay. And so the way I've done and this what is... You, yeah, what I, you I added, added was give this... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was was going to say, what you're going to do is for like a prompt engineering perspective, give this an executive summary format with no more than five points. Yeah. And hopefully that keeps it to like one page. So there's not a lot of scrolling and stuff like that. But yeah, there we go. So that was kind of the idea was, okay, take the top five points here. So what are the top IAM metrics an organization should collect, track, or monitor for in executive summary format with no more than five points? Uh, Let's see. So to ensure effective identity and access management, organizations must prioritize the tracking of crucial metrics. Here are the breakdown of the top five. All right, Jim, you read them off. All right. First is time to provision and deprovision. Second is privileged account activity. Third is failed login attempts. Fourth is number of inactive or orphaned accounts. And number five is IAM policy compliance. Um. Okay, so I'm going to pick on some of these and say what I think about them. Like, number one, time to provision and deprovision. If you're just talking about fully automated processes, like, what's the (laughs) point of tracking the amount of, (laughs) yeah, like, oh, that took like 12 (laughs) seconds. Right. Um, If you're talking about something that's disconnected, probably you're having to go to an outside ITSM system 
to get the information. And that's a kind of a complicated thing. And you may not have all that automated to pull that metric. Are you going to do all the, the figuring of that out just to provide a metric? I just, you might have to, I, that might be the reason why you go for, if you're not automated today, we're spending way too much time on tickets, creating active directory accounts or email accounts or X accounts, whatever it may be. Well, let's do the analysis, right? How much time did we spend? When was ticket created? What's the dwell time or how long has the ticket been open between when it was created and when it was resolved? You know, does it, is it four hours? two hours, 48 hours, three weeks, you know, whatever it may be. So I think it's, I still think it's a relevant metric, even though you should be automating. Chances are you're not automating everything. And that metric might give you uh, either peace of mind to say, okay, we've automated as much as makes sense, or we're deprovisioning accounts within what we said was a policy. We will turn off accounts within 24 hours of notice, eight hours of notice immediately. Are you actually doing that? For the automated ones, yes, because it's programmatic. For the manual ones, theoretically, right, those probably go into a ticket queue. Does someone get paged in the middle of the night to say, oh, Jeff's gone. I better shut down his account and make sure that he doesn't have access over the weekend, right? Things like that. Yeah. So in my mind, one of the things you can do with metrics is show how you're improving over time. And so I think that one potentially you could show improvement over time. But here's what I don't want to, to do, which is, all right, right now I'm at two minutes to provision all everything I provision. Now I'm thinking about like bringing these other apps into my scope, but they're going to have to be manually provisioned. That's going to screw up my metrics. Maybe I'll just like say they're not, I'm not going to do that. Or I'm going to do one at a time so it doesn't affect my metrics too much. So are any of us that devious? No, of course not. But it's like a the motivation is a negative motivation to mm -hmm. doing it. Well, if you're working in a large call center, ticket resolution time is a metric that staff gets measured by. I know because I got measured by it when I was in a call center. So that's my background right. was how and long did it take a, you to do it? That can be a negative, right? Because mm -hmm. you're now motivated to hang up the phone on end that call. Get the person to agree that they, you know, I can't help you. Can we hang up the call? Like, all right, what really matters is was the person's issue resolved to their satisfaction. Now you could just kick them out to some kind of survey, but however you wind up gathering that metric, I think when it comes to provisioning or onboarding or anything, if it takes two days or three days, if you go from three days to two days, yeah, that sounds better. But if the person feels like in the three day scenario, they knew what was going on and like, they're getting constant updates versus the two day scenario where, you know, they weren't getting updates or they just felt like nobody cared, you know, then your customer satisfaction score is going to be potentially worse than in a two day scenario. Mm -hmm. To me, it's all about customer satisfaction when it comes to something like this. Well, that's why most taking systems have a stat have different statuses of resolved versus closed. Resolved means we think the problem is resolved and you have X number of days or hours or whatever it is to reopen that ticket and say, no, this is not resolved. Whatever troubleshooting or whatever thing you did did not work, right? Or in this case, the access provided is still not in place or isn't working correctly. You can reopen the ticket. So ideally, you would measure the final stash, which is closed. Now, if I think I've done the work correctly, <laughs> you know, and, it, and I mark it as resolved and no one tells me that something's not right or not working, I'm going to assume it's correct. So you could measure, you know, how many tickets were, you know, marked as closed and shouldn't have been, but then how do you kind of match a new ticket to the old ticket? Because you don't really want to reopen a closed ticket, to be able to measure that time. So it gets a little bit sticky within that regards, but I still think it's a valid metric just to be able to mm -hmm. articulate how much time do we spend in identity and access management? If you had to sit yeah. down and like track you know, like a consultant, let's say, Jim, like, you know, how many hours or days or minutes do we spend on each task? And if you're out there in the real world, you know, doing identity stuff, track it for one day. And I think you'd be shocked on how much time you're spending on each individual task. It probably adds up quite a bit. That's why people have full-time jobs on this. I kind of think that you need to incentivize the right behavior. And if what you're incentivizing is potentially shortcuts or 
people trying to get off the phone. And I think we've all been on the receiving end of that. Your customer satisfaction, your satisfaction level goes down. And really that's what you're driving for is, you know, and a lot of organizations say, Hey, we're going to outsource this part of our organization. Maybe it's the, the help desk, for example. And then the help desk is kept to like, if you don't end the calls on an average time of 10 minutes, then you're going to lose 20% of your money. So then the manager within that call center is like, close those darn calls. And if you have to like provision part of the access because you don't know what the full access is, provision part of the access and close it. Now, the customer is going to be like, okay, I still, yeah, you closed my ticket, but I still don't have the access I need. That's a huge fail. Mm -hmm. So it's all about incentivizing the right behavior, just like bonuses. When you pay bonuses to people, it should be because... They're doing the behavior that you want them to do, not just that, you know, they're doing extra. The extra might not be helpful. All right. We're never going right. to get through this entire list. And in one show, <laughs> if, yeah, if we, we spend 10 we hours got on each point. <laughs> one question, everybody. So <laughs> not yeah. one question, one so question, let, one point. <laughs> yeah, right. So let me move on. All right. The second one is privileged account activity. I'm going to read this one out. Monitors the use of accounts with elevated permissions, ergo administrators, this is vital in detecting potential misuse or breaches targeting sensitive data. Personal opinion, like big red X, this is not, this is not a um, top IM metric to track. Not tracking privileged account activity? It's not a metric. What's the metric? How well, many, the times you how, how many to... admins do you have? How long were sessions, privileged sessions running? Okay, how many admins you have potentially, but if you go from 70 privileged admins to 71 or 75, like, are you doing things poorly? Or if you maybe, go from 70 not. to 65, are you doing things well? I don't know that that adds up. To me, well, that's not a good metric. This is how people gain access to systems as they elevate, right, up and over. So let's say you're a small organization and you have... 10 domain administrators, and even that might be actually might be too many for, for, for a, a, even a large company. Let's say you have five domain administrators and you have alerting set up to say, hey, if there's any domain, a new domain administrator account pops up, we have six. That's immediately a problem because we should only have five agree. at all times. The keyword used there was alerting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. that, But that's not a metric to track. To me, a metric to track is like something that shows progress in one direction or the other. I, that's why I don't think that's a good one. Well, remember like the, the next one failed the question, though, attempts. was collect, track, and monitor, or monitor for. Track or monitor What for. are the top okay. I metrics an organization should collect, track, or monitor for? I do think you should be monitoring your privileged access. I think you should know who is privileged. You should have a count on that somehow. You should be able to identify when there is weird behavior taking place, whether it's session length or maybe it's kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes transferred in a session? What if I'm dumping an S3 bucket through a privileged session that I shouldn't be doing? Like Things like that. Those are things that I would want to monitor for. I don't know if I yes. put that in an executive summary dashboard. <laughs> and right. maybe this is you know the wrong format for that, but I do think it's a valuable metric. Well, you sold me on what you just said there, but I just feel like you colored outside of the lines <laughs> a little bit versus like I'm metrics. But yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you said. Okay. So failed login attempts, I think, is a good one, but I also think um, it's so. I There's think so you many can show of them. progress over time doesn't even make a sense. I mean, anybody who has a Microsoft personal account, go to your Microsoft personal account and look at your account login attempt history, and I bet you you will find thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of attempts that are just automatically blocked, and you know they're just it's just you know password spray attacks. People are just trying to get in, you know, brute force, whatever it may be. And Microsoft just blocks by default. So, yeah, this is definitely not Jeff trying to log in from X country, you know, 48,000 times within the last minute. <laughs> right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Right. I agree. Yeah. I don't. You're right. I didn't even think of that point. But to me, that that one's not a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, number of inactive or orphan accounts. Now, this one I like. I like this one, too. Um, this is now I, I do think. If, if you're doing identity governance and you're adding 
say 10 systems per quarter. You're going to increase the number of orphan accounts each quarter when you add those applications. So you have to understand that with growth of that platform, you're going to find more orphans and more inactives. But steady state, if you can somehow adjust for that, increasing orphaned accounts, increasing inactive accounts, like that's some that just shows that's work that you need to do. And if you can reduce that number over time, then you're keeping your environment clean. So I think actually that's a good metric. And then the last one is I am policy compliance. Absolutely something that should be tracked. I don't think it's easy to track within an IAM system. I think there are ways, you know, like that's one of my big things in life, which is that, <laughs> you you know, the policies that you create are the rules of the road and whether systems are leveraging your central IAM systems or not, they still need to apply, uh, comply with the policies. You have to have some way to test the adherence to those policies or track the adherence at least. Um, but that's very hard to do with an IAM system. Yeah. That's more like a, I don't know. That's something I would definitely see like on a, a manual dashboard somewhere percentage of applications using single sign on percentage of applications using MFA, maybe even, you know, critical apps using MFA, non-critical apps using a different type of MFA right over the knee of it. But yeah, that was a little more wishy washy. I don't know if I would, it's good to know, is it executive worthy? Probably not, unless there's some sort of risk that you're not able to get buy-in for it to say, hey, we're trying to get this thing on single sign-on, and XYZ Group is really not being a good partner with us to help that happen. Exactly. If that's a major issue that you're trying to resolve is that, hey, we're putting out these policies, and various businesses are taking them seriously. They don't think they apply to them. And you can say, hey, within this business unit, 50% of the applications are not compliant with our SSO, our password policy or whatever, any of the policies. Um, then you can start to bring light, sh shine light on the darkness. <laughs> okay. Uh, not bad. If you had to give this a score from zero to 100, 100 being perfect, it just replicated the mind of Jim McDonald, which is a scary thought. Uh, and zero <laughs> meaning you're probably safe from any sort of uh, <laughs> replacement gym. How do you, would you score this one? Um, I think I'm going to give this like a 50%. That's and kind of what I was thinking. I would be real embarrassed to just highlight this, paste it into a deck, and then show it to executives. <laughs> because if yes. they start at picking on you with questions, you're, you're going to be exposed. Yeah, you have to know your content, I think. I think it's good for a, for a starter, but yeah, I was thinking this is about halfway there. Good start. It's good writing prompt. Okay, now let me start thinking about why these matter or why do these answers make sense versus just here's information. <laughs> okay. Right on. Who cares? Like, what are you trying to do with it? All right, you want to read the next one from uh, Maria in Spain? Yeah. What are the biggest challenges when it comes to implementing a successful IAM strategy in a large multinational company? Give this an executive summary format with no more than five points. By the way, that last sentence is something that, that <laughs> Jeff added, right? It is. Yeah, all these. I, I added give this an executive summary format, no five, mo, no more than five points, just to <laughs> have it be something. <laughs> None of our mailbag questions came in with that. <laughs> it's right, yeah. Uh, although I would be impressed if somebody did that. Um, so I started a new chat also, just so it wouldn't get confused with a prior question. So that's probably a good thing for if you're, switching topics is to start fresh every time. Yeah. So biggest challenges when it comes to implementing a successful IM strategy in a large multinational company. So it looks like it's got the five here. Key challenges, global regulatory complexity. That's number one. System integration and legacy infrastructure, number two. Number three is managing decentralized identities. Number four, achieving cross-departmental buy-in. And number five, balancing user experience and security. What do you think, Jim? Really good. Um, I mean, sitting here looking at the first three, I'm like really impressed. So I did get hung up a little bit on the third one because when I saw managing decentralized identity, we're not talking about like um, self-sovereign identity or mm -hmm. verifiable credentials. What we're talking about is when an organization says, 
you know, we're not going to have just one central approach to manage all the identities in one place for our enterprise. All the active customers. directories that exist from all the companies and all the Octa universal directories and ping directories and LDAPs and databases. Identities are spread everywhere. And they yeah. might even be managed by different teams and different, you know, systems and different rules and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So just looking at the first one, global regulatory compliance, is this a, one of those no particular order? Because I think that is one of the toughest ones for uh, IAM practitioners like you and I is that, um, you know, the, these talk about things like GDPR, CCPA, areas that I'm not an expert in. We have to go as practitioners and pull in the experts and really get guidance in terms of, you know, do we have to maintain identities in country? There are certain countries where you do, and the privacy of a person's data, you just can't take some of those things for granted. It doesn't all work the way it works in your country in other places throughout the world. So I know I, I learned a lot about that um, when I was, you know, earlier in my identity career and working with groups in Western Europe, like for example, Germany and France had very strict privacy laws in terms of you actually couldn't take some of that identity data from their HR system, for example, and move it into systems in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you actually couldn't even ask for some of the information, right? It was mm -hmm. like, they had like, I forget what the workers councils, I think is what they called them in Germany. It's kind of like a union where like you could only ask certain types of questions, only collect certain types of data. So I think this is actually like a very important topic. What do you think? No, I think it's, it's a reality, right? The world we live in is data sovereignty, sovereignty, or whatever the word is. Where, you know, where does it stay? And this might be a reason why you do have to have multiple active directories, multiple tenants, right? Just to keep data within specific regions. I mean, you try not to. I think you look for reasons. Do you have to do that, first of all? And then if you have to, what are the rules you have to play by? And, you know, just go from there. But I think it's a, I think it's a good thing for a high-level discussion and to say, hey, okay, yeah, we need to think about what are our regulations. Um, you know, number two is good, too all the different integrations, legacy infrastructure, your answer to the first one about what regulations may actually answer what can you integrate and what needs to stay and you know what can you modernize or do you need to keep around, right? Things like that. Yeah, and I don't know if I can specifically tie this one to identity, except my experience in working in a large multinational company was that there were a lot of legacy systems, mainframes and old systems that were hard to integrate to. Um, and I just, I think part of being part of a large multinational corporation is like, that's a fact of life. And when you have to integrate IM into those systems, sometimes it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, regardless of if you're talking about provisioning identities provisioning passwords, you know, if you want to use MFA on some of the systems, it's just, it's not even a possibility. And so, or, or to do it, you have to like jump through so many hoops that it becomes a near impossibility. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that one hits home for me as well. So then, like I said, the next one was managing decentralized identities and the idea of that it's not all central command and control, usually large multinationals. Um, and I, I've seen some of that break down over time, you know, in my, my consulting career is going into large multinationals where they have made the move to one active directory for us. And that is a great indication that they're saying, look, even though we have to have some level of, uh, division of autonomy, you know, put some autonomy in, in various places. Some of the enterprise services, it just doesn't make sense to completely delegate control, administrative control at that level. So mm -hmm. it's finding the right level. Each organization tries to figure that out for themselves. It used to, a lot of it used to be driven by, you know, the speed of networks from continent to continent. Uh, I don't think that's as much the case anymore. But I do think language, time zone, 
and just the fact of well even just like cultural think, norms right things like that and the way that different countries in the world approach different things i think it ties in with number four a little bit which was achieving cross-departmental buy-in if you don't have cross-departmental buy-in or even in this case maybe cross-country buy-in how are you going to try and figure out how to manage all those decentralized accounts, identities, teams, right, et cetera? And I think there is, you know, that's, I think that's, I think that's actually pretty good insight for an AI to answer with that here. Achieving cross mental buy-in is not a technical thing. It is more of a psychological thing, right? How are we going to convince Jim sitting in Germany to adopt the way of Jeff sitting in, I don't know, Italy, <laughs> Right. Is, are there things that are lining up like teeth where it's like, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Like from a gear perspective, there might be missing, you know, links as well. How do we make that work? I think it's actually pretty insightful for an AI to include that as part of the answer. So I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat impressed by that. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I think at the, the most basic level, you've got information security policy. It has to respect local regulations and local laws and, cultures and customs um but i think that's the underlying is like if you can get a common policy that applies across the organization um and then i think it, it starts going layer by layer into the technology and that's where you can start to run into more of the pushback um i found it's very hard to drive major technology gains across the globe without support from the top. If you're doing trying to do things always at a grassroots level and trying to make major changes across the board, you're going to face a lot of resistance. You need support from the top. And usually it's got to, like, say, for example, the CIO gets behind a security initiative, like having one active directory. If you have an organization and there are, 50 active directories and business units and geographies have their own, you know, trying to be the active directory team in corporate and say, Hey, why don't we make this one big active directory? There's too many fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. The CIO has to get behind it. And the CIO has to know he has the back of the CEO. Mm -hmm. That in my experience, that that's kind of what is required for driving it. I um, think there's one exception I think to this that. Last... Because oh, I think ahead. there might be a scenario mm -hmm. where, it might be a global organization, but the vast amount of revenue is driven by one business area that can really, you know, impose its will on the rest of the company because people are very upset to rock the moneymaker. <laughs> so it could be That's a situation right. where, you know, you really need to be thinking about what are the financial impacts? Where is the money being made? Chances are that's one thing you want to think about is you need the moneymakers on board with whatever the strategy is that you're trying to adopt. Yeah, excellent point. The last one is probably just as good as the rest. Like I, <laughs> it's AI kind of generic really though. User experience and security. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but you did ask for an executive summary. So, the being fair, I think that's a very good one. It's I mean, this is the the lifelong battle, and we we love to say, okay, FIDO two security keys or FIDO two. Um, uh, help me out here. But I don't know what you're. I don't know where you're going with it. <laughs> like uh, pass keys, um, pass keys. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Had a little brain stall there. It's, it's Friday night. One of the few uh, security tools out there where you get an improvement in both because everybody hates dealing with usernames and passwords and you know getting to possession based authentication like having control of your device and then having a device ecosystem where you just get away from passwords. All that's great, but usually when you're deploying a cybersecurity system of some sort, it has the negative. If it is improving security, it's having a negative impact on user experience. Like we can talk about DLP all day, like it should be improving security, it's making it harder to exfiltrate information from the organization. But whoever sat there in their desk is like. Uh, that DLP is blocking me from copying my files to the jump drive. I love this thing. No one, <laughs> no one's ever said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a very long way to just say, yes, consider user experience and security. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's All right. part of the we're, show. We're at almost 45 minutes. Do you want to do one more? 
Should we get one Carlos more. in? We can okay. only do one more. All right, Carlos from Brazil. Go ahead and read it while I set this up. What are some trends in IAM that you think will become more important in the near future? I'm trying to stay ahead of the curve in my industry. Executive summary format with no more than five points. All right. Survey says zero trust. Okay. I guess I don't know if that's future, but more like current. AI and behavior analytics. Of course, AI is going to say AI is important. <laughs> uh, cloud-centric IAM. Okay. I feel like that's kind of where we're at right now. Prioritizing user centricity. And number five, identity governance becomes essential. So my first question to you, Jim, of these five, zero trust, AI and behavior analytics, cloud-centric IAM, uh, prioritized user centricity, and identity governance being essential. Do you think these are um, near future from a trend perspective? Because that's the question. I I, I just can't take my eye off. I can't take my eye off the last one. Identity governance becomes essential in the near future. Um, like 10 years ago, maybe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like running water in your house is going to become, folks, that's the trend. No. Well, let's play, let's play devil's system. advocate, right? Um, could you have gotten away with manual processes 10 years ago if you're, you know, let's say a, you're, you're not a super complex organization that has multinational implications? Yeah, you probably could have gotten away with it. Is there a better way? Sure. But are we at the point where IGA essentially is mandatory to even be considered doing okay at identity? Here's the thing, Jeff. Mm-hmm. You can't take time off of investing in technology and information security. Mm-hmm. So if you were 10 years ago and you're like, yeah, hey, we're getting my manual process, we have 5,000 users, we just got you know these folks who they, they just take care of it. Where do you think you are now? Mm-hmm. You're probably way behind the curve. You're probably like, we, you know, getting breached and stuff like that. You can't take a vacation from investing. Hey, I'm not saying I so, agree. I'm just trying to play AI advocate here. I'm trying AI. to think it really hard because budgets are tough. And if you have magic IAM people, IAM heroes, as we like to say, running around behind the scenes, just making it work, and the organization doesn't feel the pain of not having, you know, modern tools, let's say. Could you have gotten away with it? I would argue, yes, it happens. It still happens today, right? But sure. should you? You can get no. away, <laughs> Jeff, you can get away without buying life insurance. Mm-hmm. But if you die, then your family will have no money. Well, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> if you own your car outright, you can maybe not have comp and collision. And then you hit you hit a stop sign. Mm-hmm. Stop sign jumps out in the middle of the road and you hit it. <laughs> and now you've got a busted up car. Yeah. And that's what's happening. Like companies are getting breached. If they knew what they needed to do, they would have obviously done it to prevent the breach. But under investing for years, like you're just passing that you're just kicking the can. And then the next leader is going to, I don't know. I, I can't get out of that, that <laughs> mode on that question. So Oh, look, I'm but the, I'm just trying to to be the you know the other side of the coin. I think I, I agree with this, and and it's only because really IGA within the last ten years has been solved for the most part. It's a mature space. Gartner doesn't do magic quadrants on it for the last what four years, five years since 2019, I think. So to me, that tells me it's done. And so within the last five years, there really isn't an excuse to say, oh, well, we can't do IGA. There are plenty of price points, you know, uh, options for this space. It's somewhat commoditized. There's always new ones coming up, right? We've had some of them on our show that are really good as well. Uh, but I feel like this is an area where if you're really going to do identity and access management as a program, you need to be doing some form of IGA, identity governance. You know who has access to what, and you know why they have the access and whether it's appropriate. That's it. Yeah. I, I think you could, okay. So going through the list again, mm-hmm. zero trust takes center stage. I think you can still make the argument yeah. that it, it's still on the way up. AI and behavior analytics. I mean, to me, that's like that's a pure winner <laughs> I mean, right there. Listen that's to the, the show, right? We're one. using it. <laughs> that's, that's the best one. Mm-hmm. Um, Cloud centric IAM. I think you can make the argument that that's still growing. For Team, a lot of organizations, Tim, it's like 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, just even the idea of like, I, even organizations that I've worked with that are doing a very excellent job in the cloud can still do better. Prioritizing user centricity. How can you argue with that one? It's kind of like you remind yourself, be a good person, be a good person, right? Even if you are a good person, generally, you just have to keep reminding yourself, be a good person. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to identity governance becomes essential. I'm not buying on that. That one's, uh, that's old hat. That's, that should have been, but for you individually, if you're not doing it or you're under invested in that area and you just know you're not doing a good job with it, do a good job. Okay. Well, I disagree. I think it is mandatory or let's just say, I think it's essential now. I think there were, I think there were arguments to be made that it wasn't necessarily as essential 10 years ago with some very big asterisks next to it finance, regulatory reasons, right? Things like that. But I think as identity becomes much more the new perimeter, it's at the center, right? It's the name of our podcast. You have to have governance around that. You have to have things like single sign-on. You have to have MFA. You have to know that kind of thing. So I'm going to, I'm. this is a hill I'm, re- I'm prepared say, to fight you for. You can't say you disagree. You said identity governance is essential now. But that's not what it says. It says identity governance becomes essential, meaning it's not essential now. It will become essential. That's not true. Well, not I think true. it's based on the maturity of the organization, the size of the industry. So the, let's read the rest of it. As orga- So identity governance becomes essential. As organizations sprawl, keeping track of who has access to what becomes difficult. I agree with that. Ident- identity governance tools will gain priority, allowing you to visualize and manage access rights and enforce least privilege. All right. I don't, you know, that's a little bit too floaty for me at the, at the end there. But the idea of, you do need to know who has access to what the larger your organization and as the organization sprawl. Yeah, I would agree with that. You need automation too. Yeah. Otherwise it becomes, I kind of want that. You, into as much as you, you need as much as you, you do as much as you can with the people you have. Mm-hmm. I did want to bring up AI and behavior analytics because it's on the, um, in our day jobs, we worked for RSM and one of our peers put on a presentation about AI governance was that Dave Mahoney, freaking... the man? Dave Mahoney, Mahoney? Were you on that? No, I wasn't able to catch that. I got to watch the replay on it because I was in the middle of another meeting. Uh, but yeah, Dave's the really man. Good. So Dave, you're listening. Um, I'm looking forward to see what you put out there. But Jim, go for it. No, it was really good. So um, he's talking about like, you know, companies really need to have, you know, starting point is you have to have a policy yep. around AI. And I asked the question, like, what, what are, there's so many use cases for AI, right? There's AI in products that you buy. So let's say you buy an IM system and it's got AI or a number of tech systems. It's (laughs) got AI, right? (laughs) Maybe it really has AI or maybe they're calling it AI. Either way, you know, you start plugging information into it. You should know, I think, what's happening with it. Other use case for AI is people doing like what we're doing. You're typing a bunch of information into an AI prompt. What's happening with that information? Does your company trust or want your employees doing that or not? Do you want to put some rules around it, et cetera? There's, um, you could be deploying IT systems that you build your own AI into. Let's say I'm building a website for our clients to go to and they can start using a chat bot to solve their issues and I wrote some kind of AI formula, or maybe I use some open source AI. I need mean, a policy around like, you know, who does that have to go through? Mm-hmm. The last use case is, let's say we build, uh, build products and we build AI into it. So I make smart home sensors and I want to build AI into that. You know, you should have a policy around that. So... Yeah. I just think it's such a fascinating area and we're really like, it's just like the cloud actually, where I kind of feel like the cloud was out there and devs went out and said, wow, this is great. We can build these apps. And then they started building things that went from pre-production to, okay, now we're going to use it for production. And then information security comes along. You're like, Oh, we got to put some guardrails on this thing. I feel like that's what's going to happen with AI. It's like, you know, people are using AI Every day, people are building AI into their products, deploying software into their their enterprise that uses AI. 
it's about to get an interesting. Yeah, I mean, it already is, I think. And I think that's, it's a wave that's coming. I don't think you can stop it. What I think you can do is educate about it. Make sure that your, your workforce or your users or employees or contractors or whatever understand the ramifications of how they can use it. You can put all the guardrails in the world you want. Oh, okay, we can't exit our computer. Guess what? I'll pull it up on my phone and do it there. There are always ways around it. So I think the education is super important right now to make people aware of, yeah, if you type in people's names into Google, into Gemini Advanced, guess what? They're in a learning model now somewhere. That's why I don't have the names listed here, right? <laughs> I, I distilled it down to just a question and, you know, should be relatively benign. But you need to be aware of what's putting, being put into those, those models. And I think it's important for education. Okay. It's Friday night. I'm ready to be done. Should we end on a lighter note? I would love to. Okay. Would you rather have the ability to teleport or the ability to read minds? I would love to be able to read minds, but I'm a little afraid of what would happen. Like if I started (laughs) realizing people. Yeah, what what am I thinking right now, Jim? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm sure it's not great. Um, And so I think I would like it, but I'd like to be able to turn it off and on. Teleporting would be pretty awesome, man. Mm Mm-hmm. I wonder yeah, but, if tele- but you don't get any miles. How are you going to get platinum <laughs> status or diamond status with Delta or whoever if you're just teleporting mm-hmm. everywhere? What's the fun in that? But just think about it. You would not need miles. <laughs> Can you but, imagine a commute? Uh, it'd be a truly global, you know, thing if we could figure out teleportation where, you know, my job is in Amsterdam, but I commute from Asheville, North Carolina every morning. <laughs> so here's a better question. I don't think mind reading is likely to I shouldn't say that put that aside do you think that someday humans will figure out how to do teleportation Mm. I don't know because I'm not smart enough to know if it's within our understanding of science and physics and all the things that could happen what I am and I feel like I read something within the last year or so that talked about teleporting like a single atom i don't know exactly what it meant i'm too dumb to to even figure out what the article is about so i feel like if it's within the realm of possibility eventually we would figure out something like that but if it truly is like an unbreakable rule of the universe whatever that means then obviously i don't think it would ever happen but i'm not gonna rule it out i mean i'm you know we're carrying around cell phones you know, we're recording this podcast through the internet and we can see and talk to each other. I mean, that would have been magic, you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> even 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you think about it, the, the laws of the universe, one of the laws of the universe, nothing can travel faster than light, which means we'll, we'll never be able to get to other galaxies. Not unless you figure out some be... sort of wormhole folding space, right? Sci-fi stuff like that. Hundreds of thousands of years with the technology that we have right now. I think to answer the question myself is that if you were to take this cap and you were to teleport it, what you'd actually teleport is a copy of it. So to our eyes, it'd be maybe indistinguishable. But I think the thing with with a person or an animal is that it would also be a copy. And the thing with person or animals that you have electrical and chemical signals going from your brain so i kind of feel like you can make a copy of the mass but probably not of the energy and that you'd probably be transported and then like what would happen probably interesting drop dead (laughs) or yeah what if it's more of a instead of a a teleporter a replicator right now i'm I'm thinking star trek you know T, Earl Grey, Earl, Earl Grey, hot, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, I'll take that. I be, honestly, that would be that'd be enough for me. So I'm going to change my answer, and I, I'll just take the replicator. <laughs> well, that wasn't the question. It was teleportation or the ability to read minds. My gut reaction yeah. is, of course, read minds. I'd always want to know, okay, what's going on, so I can kind of figure things out and make sure that you know I'm on the <laughs> that, that I'm on the good side of whatever it needs to be. But then you you did mention the thing about being able to turn it off. I was like, oh yeah, that you know that could be pretty crowded in someone's head for a while <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, so if i can turn it off see... ability to read minds if i can't turn it off then yeah i'm gonna sacrifice my delta diamond status and go with teleportation have you ever <laughs> have you ever heard 
Uh, or have you ever seen the show True Blood? Yeah, of course. Okay. I only saw it because Denise wanted to watch it. It's not my kind of show. I liked it. I thought it was great. <laughs> she could read minds, right? And mm-hmm. it like would drive her crazy sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, what, that's, that's typically the drawback you see in any sci-fi thing, is if you can read minds, how do you filter out? Like Professor X from the X-Men, right? Same thing. And... Um, you know, other characters of the like that can do that kind of stuff. Okay. We got really fantastical what, here on a, on a Friday. I don't night. know what you're talking about anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's keep this under an hour. Um, we'll wrap it up there. We're on the web, idacpodcast.com on Twitter, X, whatever it's called, at IDAC Podcast, Mastodon at IDAC Podcast at infosec.exchange. Reached out on LinkedIn and connect with Jim and myself if uh, you're interested in attending the happy hour or whatever it is we're trying to do at Identiverse, reach out to Jim or I on LinkedIn uh, and follow us on YouTube. We're starting to build up that channel. So like, subscribe, get notified. Uh, all of our audio episodes are already there, but uh, we're going to try to put some more video stuff up there too. So uh, you want to, you know, subscribe and hit that bell to be notified when new ones come in. So, all right, Ring that's my the bell. <laughs> Ring the bell. All right, that's it. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll talk with y'all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.